do you want the horror of failure or the certainty of failure? The horror mm. of potential failure or the certainty of failure? Because if you don't mm. do this, you will fail. Now, it'll be put off, but it will absolutely happen. And so that fear, I understand why that stops people. It, there's, it's no joke to be rejected. And it's going to happen while you practice. And it's a real fear. But you're deluding yourself by thinking that there's a no fear option. There's just a delayed fear option, right? Because if you don't get this mm. right, well, you're going to fail for sure. And then you're going to be miserable and vindictive and bitter and anxiety ridden. And you're going to cause trouble for yourself. And you're going to take it out on women and other men. And like, that's an ugly path, man. And so I see why yeah. you're afraid, but you should be way more afraid of that. Yo, what's good, everybody? This is Afiz, and welcome back. Welcome back. I, I can't even say to another episode because this is not just another episode. This is not just another conversation. This, in my opinion, I've talked to a lot of amazing people, but this is the most anticipated episode and conversation of my entire life. And before I introduce uh, guess I got to tell you guys a brief story. Growing up, my favorite holiday was Christmas. I love Christmas more than anybody. I could not sleep the night before Christmas because I was so excited about what could come. And every single year, um, I would write the one and only Santa Claus a letter, giving him a list of all the things that I desired and I wanted for Christmas. Every then the next year, I mean, the next day, I wake up in the morning, I go downstairs, and I I, I look under the tree. And not saying my parents weren't good parents, but the letter that I got wrote Santa Claus was always accompanied with another letter from Santa Claus telling me that this year, some of the things that I wanted, I wasn't going to be able to get. And maybe I will be able to get it next year. Nevertheless, regardless of the, the opposition, regardless of what I didn't get, I kept on writing letters year and year, and I kept on getting letters back from Santa Claus saying what I wanted more than anything in the world, I would unfortunately not be getting it that year. But what that experience taught me was that when you want something in life, you, you got to be persistent. When you want something in life, you have to write it down. And it was about maybe five years ago, and I was sitting down, and I turned on YouTube, and then all of a sudden, I see this thumbnail of this distinguished gentleman on Joe Rogan's podcast. And I said, oh, this seems like an interesting conversation. I clicked on that thumbnail and, and watched the video and it absolutely changed my life. The, the wisdom, the knowledge, the information that this man was sharing, the things that he was talking about, the way he could construct his ideas, it was so absolutely powerful to me. And for the, past, for the next couple of years, every time this man put out a video, I would watch and consume every piece of content. And I went ahead and I, and I wrote down on a piece of paper, I said, you know what? If anything can happen, what would be an absolute honor is for me to be able to sit down and have a conversation with this man. So I made it my, one of my life goals, I said, but without a shadow of a doubt, I would sit down and have a conversation with this man. And I would always write it down and I always pray to God, God give me this opportunity. I'm glad to say about over four years later, you know, my prayers were answered and I got the opportunity right now to sit down with one of my favorite human beings of all time. This individual is on my Mount Rushmore of people right besides my father and obviously Gary Vee as well. And I am beyond ecstatic to introduce the audience to this man. And hopefully the words that he shares today has, will bless you as much as it has blessed me. So without further ado, please, guys, welcome to the show, the one and only Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. Jordan, Dr. Jordan Peterson, welcome to the show. Hi, Hafiz. I don't think I've had a nicer introduction than that. So much appreciated. And I'm looking very much no forward problem, to talking Dr. to you. No. It's a pleasure. I, I told myself I'm not going to cry, but you know, this, yeah, I this probably means will. A lot to me. <laughs> <laughs> this means yeah. a lot to me, and I'm, I'm super grateful. So, Dr. Peterson, for those who don't know you, can you give a bit of an elevator pitch synopsis about who you are, what you do, and all that good stuff? Well, I'm a psychologist. Uh, 
I had a long research career, uh, about 20 years publishing scientific papers. I'm a clinical psychologist. I practiced for about 20 years as well. I haven't been practicing specifically for the last five years. I'm an author. I wrote a book called Maps of Meaning, which was published in 1999, and it was an investigation into the relationship between belief and emotional regulation and religious thinking. I was trying to account for the human tendency to, well, to be so allied with what we believe and why that's so important to us, and also for the proclivity for us to do atrocious things, and that was a very serious and difficult book. And then in, I published two books for more popular audiences uh, much later than that, I think 12 Rules for Life, uh, Antidote to Chaos came out in 2016, and then the new book Beyond Order came out last year. So I'm an author and a speaker, I suppose, and I have a YouTube podcast, and it seems to be quite successful, and people are positively inclined towards it. And I'm very, very fortunate because I can now talk to anybody I want on this podcast, pretty much, and so that's unbelievably exciting. And so I, I, this is the end of my little speech, I suppose. I was very much interested, obsessed by the idea of ideological possession and also by human malevolence and the sorts of things that happened in Nazi Germany and in the Soviet Union and, well, in many places, many, many places. And what I concluded from all that, I suppose, is that the best way to protect us from such things as we move forward is to help build better individuals. And that was allied with my extreme interest in clinical psychology, which is an individual on individual pursuit. And so I tried to bring that in my university experience as a lecturer and speaker to as wide an audience as possible. And, and here we are. No, that's awesome. No, I, I definitely, I, I, I love, I love um, 12 Rules for Life and Beyond Order. This is exceptional reads. And, and, I, and I think it's just so powerful that the messages that you give can impact so many people. So Dr. Peterson, what I, what I want to do is I want to take a trip into the DeLorean and I want to go back in time because we, I know Dr. Peterson, the, uh, the amazing man that stands before me today, but I, I want to know who Jordan was at, at 16 years old. So, so if you were to go back in time to you know Fairview and Alberta, who was Jordan Peterson at 16 years old? What was that guy like? Well, um, I didn't care much for school, I wouldn't say. Uh, although younger than that, I was younger than that when I took my first university course. I was just remembering that this year. There was a professor named Dennis Wheeler who taught at this local college. It was about 90 miles away. Um, and he was interested in distance education. He came up north to our little town and taught a course on political science, which I took when I was 14, and I really liked that. So there were some aspects of academic pursuit that I loved, and I read a lot. I pretty much read a book a day from the time I was about 10 till, well, till I started reading really serious books and couldn't read one of those in a day. So for <laughs> years, you know, and I had a, it was a working class place and all my friends pretty much were working class kids. Most of them dropped out of school in grade nine or grade 10 and then went off to work on the oil rigs that, where they could make a fortune, especially for someone that young. Um, I worked from the time I was 14 onward. I worked in restaurants and I liked that a lot. I worked first as a dishwasher, which was an impossible job for me to begin with um, till the German chef took pity on me and showed me how to do it after I struggled away for about three weeks, like swamped by dishes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I liked that because I was treated like an adult and I really appreciated that. And I worked, I had a bit of a political interest. Well, more than a bit at that point. I, I worked for a local, our local member of the legislative assembly, at the provincial level, so that's the state level for you American types, and I was interested in socialist ideas at that point, and that lasted, that, that political interest of, of that precise sort lasted till I was about 17, I would say, when I realized that I just didn't know anything and that a political career at that point, which was something that was open to me in a strange way, uh, that would have, that was radically premature. And so, that was me at 16, I would say. I, that, I was in grade 12 then. I went, I went to college when I was 17, left home when I was 17. Oh, wow. So, um, 
So you went to college when you were 17 years old. So 16 years old, you were- yeah, It was so very annoying because I friend. couldn't get in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> it was very annoying because all my friends would go to the bar and sometimes even classes were held there and I couldn't go. And I looked like I was like 13. So there was no way I was sneaking in. So. And, and where did you do your undergraduate, um, Dr. Peterson? I did two years at this local college, Grand Prairie Regional College. Okay. And it was in a beautiful building designed by a native Canadian architect named Douglas Cardinal. It was his first major commission. It was an outstanding building, absolutely beautiful, curved brick on the outside, no, no square corners, beautiful white rounded interior. And um, I had great professors there. I had, I, I, it's so interesting because I was just writing about that this week. I had six professors there that were outstanding. One in biology, political science, English literature, history, art, um, who else was there? I didn't name all six, but that's close. And they were all men, as it turned out. Uh, and they were really deeply committed to teaching. The English professor, professor Robin Burke, um, he, I think he gave me like a three out of nine on my first essay, which just shocked the oh, wow. hell out of me. Yeah, yeah, it was quite the shock because I thought I could write. I got good grades in high school despite not doing any work. And I'd never really run into someone who could actually write and he could write and I couldn't at all. And so he taught me. He was a tough guy and, and you know, a strict guy, but my friends and I loved him. And I was so fortunate because I, I got together with a good group of friends. Some a couple of them came with me from Fairview and we all sat together in, in these classes. And so I had a really good social life there. Um, our whole little cadre took over the student union the second year I was at this little college and we ran a huge surplus, which was the first time that ever happened. I, we couldn't figure out how you could possibly run a deficit at a student government when you could hold dances and sell beer to undergraduates. It was like, how can you not make a profit doing that? Anyways, it was a blast and I got a really good education there for two years. And then I went to the University of Alberta for a year and finished my bachelor's degree. And that was political science with a minor in English. And you could get a three-year degree at that point. And then I worked for, no, I, yeah, I worked on road crews for six months and then went to Europe for four months. And then I went to university again for a year because I decided that I was going to study psychology. So I took nothing but psychology courses for a whole year and got a second BA, you know, not exactly, but that's how it worked. And uh, then I worked for another year and then I went to graduate school. So that was, that was, okay. that was all that. So would you say majority of your friends um, were working in the oil rigs or would you say majority of your friends went on to college with you? Oh, no, no, no. Hardly anyone from my graduating class went on to college. There was me and yeah. a handful of other people. Virtually everyone stayed in, in this town. Uh, and most, uh, you know, I had different friends, somewhat different friends in high school than I did in junior high because junior high was grade seven to nine because so many of my previous friends had dropped out of school and so and then a new crowd came in these were kids that were they lived in an even more remote place called bear canyon which was literally on the edge of the prairie frontier like and and there was no high school there so they came to as residents they they had to live with families and they were they stayed in school though those three characters i'm still in touch with all three of them they were great friends of mine and one of them came to college with me and was a roommate for a while and but I, but that was it most people didn't yeah. go no yeah so do you feel as though you were a um a individual who was moving to the beat of your own drum and had more of a leader disposition because it would appear that if you're in an environment where all your other peers are not interested in going to school, there could be easy proclivity for an individual to not decide to go to school as well and to, you know, chase the money during the oil rig. So what was it inside of you that made you be able to, you know, still desire the path of higher education, though everybody else is moving in a different direction? Well, my parents were both university educated and so my dad was a teacher, he's still alive. Um, and my mom was a nurse. They had both left the small town they were from in Saskatchewan, it was an even smaller town, and, and gone to university. And 
it was just expected in our house. I never questioned it. I knew, I knew from the time I was 11, 10, that I was going to leave Fairview and, and, and pursue my education. I didn't know how far, and at that point, I didn't understand the tiers of higher education, you know, bachelor, master's, mm -hmm. PhD, um, but I knew. And, you know, it was I interesting because virtually everyone I knew that did leave that little town knew that they were going to leave when they were that young. Mm. And so it's hard to tell why these things happen. I wouldn't say that it was precisely, I wouldn't say that it was because I was a leader exactly, because my friends weren't followers. None of them, including the kids who went off to work on the oil rigs, those kids were tough, man. And part of the reason they quit school is because they got sick and tired of putting up their hands to ask to go to the bathroom when they were, you know, <laughs> pretty much men. And they were men enough to go work on the rigs. So. So no, I wasn't leading them. I was small and because uh, I had skipped a grade. So I was younger than everyone else in my class and I was rather small for my age anyways. And so I was surrounded by guys generally who had a lot more physical prowess than me. Um, I didn't really participate in team sports until I went to graduate school, um, oh, wow. partly b because of that reason. Although I went skiing with my my father and cross country skiing and trapping and that and and hunting and that sort of thing. So um but I was much more academically inclined than most of my friends and I wasn't exactly from the same kind of working class background that they were from. So most of my friends their parents had finished high school or not. Um mm. I had one friend who whose parents were university educated. And he did go to college, but he never he never continued. He had he had some pretty severe mental health problems, unfortunately. Um, so, um, how many siblings did you have? Two. I had a I have a younger sister. She's a year and a half younger than me, Bonnie, and I have a brother who's four and a half years younger than me, Joel. And they okay, both so went off to college and and, okay. and pursued their education. So, how would My you go ahead? How would you describe your father? Hmm. He wasn't someone you trifled with, I can tell you that. I can give you a story about that. So he was a teacher for a lot of his life and he taught grade six. Uh, he wasn't my homeroom teacher in grade six because, he, because there was another grade six teacher and I was his son, so they put me in the other grade six teacher's homeroom. But he taught math and taught arithmetic slash math. And I remember the first time my class had him as a teacher, and we were 12 and kind of rowdy, you know, like 12 year olds are. By 13, we were way too much of a handful for most of our mm -hmm. teachers. You know, we drove them really crazy. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. But so they were, we were already pretty rowdy, I would say. And I swear that for 10 minutes before he walked into the room, no one said a thing. <laughs> and it wasn't because he was mean. He wasn't mean, but you didn't mess with him. And that was what it was like at home. You know, like dad was an intimidating figure. and. And now having said that, I should also say that he was, he, he was and he is unbelievably good with little kids who he, he has a mm. real soft spot for little kids, a uh, little harder on teenagers probably. And, per, you know, they're not as trustworthy teenagers. And, <laughs> and, uh, but he was, and he paid a tremendous amount of attention to me when I was young and taught me to read and the memories that are like I hold dear. And that really shaped me, all that attention I got from him when I was, well, before I went to school, was unbelievably beneficial to me. I mean, one thing my dad did for me, and my mom played a role in this, but it's, it's harder to say exactly what it was. My relationship with my mother was much easier. She's, a, she's, an, she's an easy person to get along with, an easy person to love. She also has a great sense of humor, so I could always make her laugh, and that was wonderful. And, but my dad had extremely high standards, and it was difficult to please. And so I had this strange sense from him that, I could do, that he was confident that I could do anything, but that nothing I did was ever quite good enough. And mm. so there's a roughness to that, you know, but there's, there's also an advantage. And it's a tough one because when you love your kids, eh, there's two things you do for them. One's more maternal, I would say, and one's more paternal. Although either parent could play the role. The maternal is love, you know, it's like, I love you just the way you are, I think you're great. And that's what you have for babies. And and you know, and it, that's the kind of love that makes you always welcome at home in some sense, no matter what you've done. But the paternal love is sort of like, 
I love you, but there could be more to you. And so it's in its mm. best form, it's encouragement. And yeah. to know someone has your back, and I've always known that my parents had my back, and it's a big deal. And, you know, part of what I see that affects me so profoundly emotionally when I go lecture, for example, is I see so many young people who don't have that, you know, who've never mm. really heard a word of encouragement. And God, that's such a lack. It's and that's so I, I was so fortunate in that a lot of my friends, the majority of them certainly didn't have that from their father in particular. So yeah, and they still have my back, my parents, you know, <laughs> So that's, I will often, when I was, when I went on my book tour, so I went on a book tour in 2019, no, 18, went to about 150 cities, so it was extensive all over the world. Often before the tour, I would phone them. And so, which kind of strange in some ways, I was damn near 60, you know, and they're in their 80s, but <laughs> it was a ritual. That was, it was partly a ritual. And I needed that ritual before I went and talked to, you know, the crowds were usually you know, several thousand people or some up to 10,000 people. It was just a way of touching something familiar, I suppose, before I wandered out into the unknown. So. No, that makes that. No, thank you for sharing that. No. And the reason why I asked that is because I, I had a feeling that was so, you know, um, my father's um, next to you on the Mount Rushmore. <laughs> um, and my father is somebody who's extremely powerful um, individual as well, extremely fantastic with children. I actually was an educator for a couple of years as well. And I did preschool and all the, you know, the, the women, I was at, I was at this private school and, and, you know, the first day of school, he had this black guy, you know, like this football player, black guy, like the teacher, the classroom, and then all the women were like, Oh, what's going on here? But they all of them fell in love with me. And they were like, you're so good with children. I tell them, well, it's cause of my dad, my dad mm -hmm. was just, he had a supernatural gifting with just, with just young children. And so I've always found the, the impact that my dad showed me because I know a lot of men you've experienced it before. They, they, they've never heard their father tell them, I love you, or their father put their arm around them or give or them any play. value. Play with them. You know, like uh, I had a friend who didn't have a father and he was over at our house a lot until I was about 12 or 13 and we sort of separated paths after that. But my dad sort of took him on as a second son for a number of years. And I used to wrestle with this friend of mine and he was so awkward. You, you couldn't wrestle with him without him sticking his thumb in your eye or some damn thing. And <laughs> on, on later recollection, I realized, because I studied rough and tumble play when I was a research psychologist at, at McGill and at, at, and at the University of Toronto. And he didn't have that opportunity to engage in that play. And one of the things that a father does, I think, technically speaking, is, is help set up a secure environment, right? A safe environment within which play can take place because when children play they're experimenting with who they could be in a, in a really deep sense it's not optional this and rough and tumble play is not optional either when when my kids were little both of them i set up this couch my wife and i set up this sectional couch and so it was three pieces and then three pieces so it was like two couches facing each other and it was so it was like it was walled in. It was a little wrestling ring. And I used to bounce them around and throw them in the air and like wrestle with them right to the edge of their tolerance continually. And it's it's that's how kids figure out what hurts and what doesn't hurt like directly. And they they figure out what's fun and what isn't fun physically. So they're sort of learning to dance, which which is probably what's being assessed when women assess men for dance, for example. <laughs> and so. Well, all that interaction I had with my dad and, and my mom too, like I shouldn't leave her out of this it, because she's a great person and, and she's, I don't really ever remember having a fight with my mom, you know, we used to drive her crazy enough so that she would cry, you know, from time to time. <laughs> and, and that was quite rare, but, but she was not a, she was, she is not a harsh person. She's got a spine. She's got a backbone. She's no pushover, but, uh, but uh, what was really, I think, markedly different in my house from most of my friends' house was how much time my father spent with me. And the fact yeah. that fundamentally, even when we had disagreements when I was a teenager, and certainly a lot of those were due to me, uh, fundamentally, he was still, he was on my, he was on the better part of me, on the side of the better part of me, you know? And I think that's a real kind of love, right? It's like, 
I love the better part of you, and so when I see you deviate from that, it really hurts me. I don't like that. And that's judgmental, too, and in this society, you know, and you're not supposed to be judgmental, which is, of course, patently ridiculous. But because you, you want to be judged by someone fair and wise, but God, someone's got to help you separate the wheat from the chaff. And so, oh, and that, there's oh. a harshness in that, but, but life's harsh, man. So, yeah. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break from this week's episode to talk to you guys about our amazing sponsor over at Skillshare. Skillshare is a one-of-a-kind learning community where you can learn all types of creative entrepreneur design business skills. Man, Dr. Peterson is such a wealth of information, a wealth of knowledge, and all the resources that he provides for us is really going to transform our lives. But Skillshare is another vast library for information which gives you guys practical courses for free that you can implement into your life today. You don't have to wait till tomorrow to make a change. After this episode, you can go to Skillshare.com slash roommate, sign up. You get one month for free, meaning that you don't have to pay any money, and you have this vast library of skills to build yourself up to the man that you've always wanted to be. So guys, please don't just be a hearer of truth, also be a doer of truth and apply information to your life. So go to Skillshare.com slash roommates, go ahead and sign up. Trust me, you'll be thanking me later, and let's get back to this week's episode. No, that's true. Uh, I was talking to uh, Dr. Warren Farrell a couple of weeks ago, and we were, we were having a conversation that you know that you guys had as well about the importance of rough and tumble play in the development of young young children, especially young boys. And 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 you're right. And I think that's a part of the of the story that I wanted to hear because I think that it's so powerful for fathers to be in the home to to be able mm -hmm. to help develop children. I think there's a lot of studies that that talk about that in a lot of communities. One of the biggest things that is a, a game changer is not just so much how many fathers in the home, but just how many fathers in the communities. Yeah, right. That's right. That's that's a big predictor of 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 well of flourishing in those communities, right? Yes. There's good evidence. Exactly. For that. Yeah, well we're exactly. kind of, it's kind of rough, eh? Because you see a single mother, and I've had plenty of single mothers as clients, and they're struggling away mightily and and in some ways heroically often. And you don't want to say, well, you know, you're just not doing that great a job because often that's not true. But then you have to also balance against that the fact that, yeah, well, still, this is a two person job and it's yeah. pretty hard to be mother and father. Like, I really saw that with my wife. Eh? That, it was kind of interesting to watch that as the kids grew up because my wife is actually tougher than me temperamentally. She's less agreeable oh, than wow. me. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> got it. well, I'm not, I'm pretty high in compassion and, and agreeableness. Uh, and she's quite a bit lower, quite low for a woman. And so she's kind of, she's got that a masculine edge to her in that way. Um, makes her caustically funny and, and provocative. It's a very interesting thing to see. She was really a good mother. You know, when, when my, when, when I was, when we had our first child, Michaela, we lived in this little apartment in Montreal and I built this loft bed out of two by fours. The thing would have withstood an earthquake and so, because we only had one bedroom and I built a crib for Michaela underneath the, our loft bed and at night when Tammy, when Michaela would make a peep and stir, Tammy would be up out of that bed down the little ladder and taking care of her so quickly that she wouldn't wake up and, and cause a fuss and so we, we got a pretty good sleep. She was unbelievably responsive but even with her toughness, I could see that, that there's this transition that has to happen as a child gets older, right? Because when they're six months old or nine, nine months old and younger, you have to be pretty much 100% compassionate because the infant is so helpless. But then you have to transition from that to, to being, well, to be foster independence and also to implement more discipline. And because the mother gets so tightly bonded to the infant, and also because women are more temperamentally agreeable, it's, it's not an easy thing to master both of those, right? Mm. And so it's nice to have, well, it's optimal to have two people around. And, and we shouldn't be afraid to say that, you know, like single mothers can do the job, but man, that's hard life. And you're likely to be poor if you do that, very likely to be poor, even if you started out middle class or above. It's a, it's yeah. a very easy route to poverty. And so, Optimally, two, and 
you know, and hopefully you have some grandparents and some other competent adults around to help you out, even if there's two of you. So we, yeah. we have to figure out how to value what single mothers do or single parents, let's say, without simultaneously devaluing the necessity of having a father in the house because it's it's necessary. Yeah, no, you- a hundred percent. No, I think those are those are extremely powerful works. I think what society does is that because, you know, the, the compassion and the empathy um, of the situation that these women are in. And like you said, they're they're heroes. They're, they're, they're doing the best with the tools that they have. But then there still has to be a culture where you're where you're not just, you know, encouraging people where they're at, but pushing the next generation to where things should be and what's optimal for all hu- human beings. So that's something that, you know, we believe yeah, and you in. Should, you know, we have to. We have to be able to say to young men, it's like, take care of your damn kids, you weasel. You know, <laughs> what are you doing walking away from them? What are you doing? That's the adventure of your life you're missing. And you know, if we, if we were more forthright about this in some sense, we, c- we could advertise children to young men because if you think that they're just a responsibility, that just means that you don't know what the hell is going on because they're unbelievably fun, especially if you're... So I worked in daycares when I was a young man, which also made me someone quite strange because I was the only guy in those daycares. And I yeah, used I worked to, there too. I couldn't, I couldn't do this now, but, but I could then. So the kids, I used to rut, do airplane rides with them, you know, where you grab their arm and their leg and, sp- and swing, them swing them around? around? Yeah, 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 they yeah. love that. They would line up for that, right? <laughs> and they, I used to draw them little monsters on pieces of paper. They were just like X's with teeth and a big glaring <laughs> eye. And they, they would line up for that too. And these are kind of male <laughs> things to do, you know? And kids, and, and this is something I got from my father, I think, this ease with children. They're unbelievably fun if you're allowed to play with them. And men have that physical play element to their character. And so... You shouldn't be thinking of them just as a responsibility. The other thing too is that the relationship you have with your kids, if, you're, if your eyes are open, that is the best relationship you will ever have with anyone in your life. I was thinking about my son. He tears me up because I've been so sick, I haven't seen much of him, but he came up for Thanksgiving, which was great with his wife and his son, and he's a very good father, it's lovely to see. And you know, I can't really ever remember having a fight with him. I mean, he got upset sometimes when he was a kid and so on, but we had a pretty untrammeled relationship all the way through, and it was great. I think probably, I, I don't, I think probably the relationship I had with, have with him, had with him, was the best relationship in my life, you know, and and I don't say that lightly because I have a, I love my wife and we have a great relationship mm-hmm. and I have other people in my family who are very close, including my daughter. She was more complicated because she was so, she was very ill for much of her childhood. And so that complicated things a lot. But, you know, you don't take care of your kids. Well, what are you doing? Exactly. What's going to be better than that? Like you need some meaning in your life, man. And where are you going to get something that's better than that? And I don't see 100%. it. I don't see it at all. No, I, I agree with you, Dr. Peterson. I think one of the, the biggest tra- tragedies that occur in today's society is that, you know, it, it, the, there's no longer an incentive for men to, you know, be fathers. You know, there's, there's, there's an agenda that, that's pushed at times about how fathers are absolute, you know, f- Father's Day now is just, you know, Mother's Day again. And, and so I think, unfortunately, a lot of men feel very useless in their role as a parent. And I think that's unfortunate because like from my personal experience. Women are often afraid of the way that men interact with children. And it's partly, you know, an extension of their proclivity to protect. And so it can seem intimidating. And that's what men do to play, for example, to play more roughly. Um, Because it does take some courage on the part of a doting mother to, for example, let a man throw her baby up in the air, throw her infant up in the air, you know, I mean, in play, obviously, and there is danger in it, but it's tremendous excitement. I mean, children love that kind of play. And so, and, you know, it also speaks to a, a sort of deep distrust that many women have of men because the mm. relationships they had with their own father, or with their boyfriends or with their brother, perhaps, has been pathologized in some manner. And so there's a distrust. And 
fair enough. But, you know, trust is courage once you're not naive. And if you don't trust your father, your, your mate, your, your, your partner, if you're a woman, you have a child, you don't trust your mate, then you cannot entice the best out of him. You can't. You have to trust first and invite and say, well, yeah, I know you're just as stupid as me, but, you know, I'm going to trust you to, to do your best and to learn. And that's, a, that's real courage. That takes real courage, especially when it's your child that you're dealing with. But it's much yeah. better for the child and for you because then you don't have to do all the work as a woman. And I mean, I saw women all the time in my practice, but also, you know, as I had kid and kids and met other families who would really covertly punish their husbands every single time they interacted with their kids. They'd glare or mm. say something caustic or, or interfere in some way. And, and you do that 50 times to your partner and they're, they're out of the game, man. They're, you've, you've, you've pretty much finished that. So. Yeah. No, that's true. And I, and I think definitely, you know, hopefully episodes like this would be able to help women understand the importance of it. And Dr. F F Warren Farrell's books talked about that as well. And so I think that's a great, great point to bring up. It might, well. be hel might be helpful, too, for me to tell you h how my wife and I came about to the decision to have kids. Because okay, go, this is something this. men might want to know. Well, look, when I, I, my, I got together with the woman who was going to become my wife, Tammy. I mean, I've known her since we were eight, and she was a friend of mine when I was a kid, and so we've known each other forever, but we got together seriously when we were in our late 20s, and she was really ready to have a family, like now. And I didn't have a permanent job at that point, although my, you know, my prospects were good, which is part of the reason she married me. And, <laughs> and, but she wanted to start, and I thought, okay, so why don't, I didn't really want to do that. And I thought, okay, what's your problem, Jordan? What, what is it that you're worried about? And I thought, well, there's an economic issue. That, that's not really serious. I, I'll, I'll get a job and she'll come along wherever I go if I have that job. So that's not an issue. It's like, so what then? Well, babies. What the hell do I do know about babies? Nothing. I can't take care of a baby. I don't know how to do that. So I said to her, well, the reason I seem to be objecting is because I'm kind of doubtful about the infant stage, like toddlers, I know what to do with them. I can play with kids, but when they're under a year, they're like a foreign object to me in many ways. I don't, I don't know what to do. And so that worries me. And so I'll tell you what, if you'll take primary care for the infant, I'll take care of you and the infant. And <laughs> how would that be? And, and I think that's the right role. I really do believe that. And you might think, well, that's sexist. It's like, well, no, not necessarily. How are you so sure that that first year as a mother isn't one of the great parts of the fundamental adventure of being female? Like, so don't, don't give me any crap about that being sexist. That's just, I don't think so. You know, and so what I would do is watch my wife and if she got tired, spell her off. And I did what I could to take care of the infant, but I knew that you know, she would take care of that while I stumbled around trying to learn how. And she did that. Mm -hmm. And that worked fine. And then, you know, as the kids got older, I took more and more responsibility for them. And when my daughter was about two and a half, I think that's right, one and a half, we had our second child. And then I, I took care of Michaela, the older child, quite a lot after that, because Tammy, of course, was busy, especially that first year with the infant, with Julian. But that worked well. That was a good division of labor as far as I was concerned. And also my wife was very happy about that because she loved to take care of infants. And that's characteristic of a lot of women, you know, and even those that don't admit it. And it's too bad they don't yeah. admit it because what, there's something wrong with that? Is there some, I saw this tweet the other day about this whoop, grandmother, mother of an, you know, a mature daughter. And the daughter had announced that she was never going to have kids and the, the her mother said, oh, I think that's just great. You know, you're going you're gonna to just live for you. And that's just wonderful. And I'm glad you can be so independent. And I thought, how could you possibly say something that stupid to your daughter? It's like, you don't want grandchildren? And, and you're, you're, so, you're so sure that she's just not ideologically addled about the fundamental realities and, and, and beauties and depth of life? It's like, how many things do we do? We have a career if we're lucky or a job if we don't. If we're not, we have an intimate relationship, we have a family, that's life, man. You miss one of those, it's, yeah. well, you can do it, but it's, 
it's a big deal not to do that. Yeah. So, yeah, no, no, that's true. I think I think it's quite interesting because I I would always hear stories about when there was, you know, older, successful men who, who have mi millions of dollars and cars and everything in the world and on their lifetimes on their deathbed the people that what they wish the most is to spend more time with their loved ones so i can only imagine an individual just simply pursuing whatever you know vanity or or whatever pleasures that they're desiring and then to be at the end of their life and to realize that you never had the opportunity to be able to have a family just because you were obsessed with some ideology that some you know radical professor was teaching you at your you know at your local college yeah, or you, or you, you know, you you had a more materialistic bent, and that can easily happen too. You know, you you think that the pleasures that wealth can bring you as a uh, what, as a solitary and free individual outweigh the terrible, you know, burdensome responsibility of a family. But if you're just if you're just thinking of that responsibility as burdensome, you're you're not thinking straight. It's like no, no, you don't understand. That's a wonderful opportunity. That's what that is. And it comes at a cost, like all opportunity. And you see that too. One of the saddest things I saw fairly regularly as a clinician was, you know, couples that had decided too late that they wanted to have kids and then, you know, were just mm. turning themselves inside out with, with attempts to become, to conceive and often failing. And Jesus, you know, that's hard to recover from once you realize that's yeah. what you want and it doesn't happen. So don't, and, the other thing that people don't really realize is that your things go by pretty quick. You know, that, that period of time when your kids are little, it seems like a long time when you think about it beforehand and even sometimes when you're living through it, but it's gone and you want to, you want to take advantage of that. And I had a great career and I still do, but I can't say that it was more important to me, like existentially than my family. Like I've had a, I couldn't have possibly imagined having a career that was more, what would you say? It offered me everything I could have possibly wanted. Also a lot of trouble, but, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, and so I was exceptionally fortunate in that regard. But nonetheless, if I had to pick, like, I picked my family. Yeah, because of the quality of the experience, you know, that I'm not just saying that out of a sense of obligation or duty. It's like, no, it fundamentally, that was, that was deeper. And I tried to teach the deepest things I could conceptualize and, and succeeded in that at least to, to the degree that I could conceptualize them. But still, you know, it's like, no, no, when push comes to shove, especially those years I spent with Tammy in Boston when our kids were little. It's like, man, there is something to that. Don't miss it. Yeah. Stupid guys, don't um, miss that. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Peterson. I think one of the, the, the blessings of doing this show is I'm able to bring older, uh, wiser men such as yourself to be able to give wisdom that a lot of young people are overlooking. So I definitely hope that people take that seriously. So my uh, question to you, Dr. Peterson, was... You, you, you've counseled so many numerous people throughout the years um, in your practice and probably just so many different young adults, especially young men. What would you say from your personal experience has been one of the, the most consistent issues that you see plaguing young men and holding them back from all your years of experience? Well, one of them is um, wrong attitude towards education. Mm. And, you know, because it's, it's easy... And I, like I said, temperamentally, I was disinclined to enjoy school, especially from grade seven through grade 12, especially Why do you junior say that? high. Well, all my friends were kind of delinquent types in some ways. And so they acted up and so did I. And I was pretty mouthy. But also, it was too slow for me. You know, like if... When, when I took language arts in grade eight, I had read the whole year's books in the first, I think it was the first day, but it was certainly the first week. And so mm. it just bored, I was just bored to death. So that wasn't so good. Um, and, you know, there, it can be a bit infantilizing because of the rule structure. Like I said, a lot of my friends, they just weren't going to put up their hand when they wanted to go to the bathroom anymore. And they were just done with that. And, but... 
One of the things young men aren't taught properly, and I mean even at the age of, let's say, 11, young, is like, there is nothing that will make you more powerful than your words. And so if you think that reading and writing is for pansies and dimwits, you know, or teacher's pets, because they get in less trouble in school, let's say, you're seriously misinformed. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I talk to people like Jocko Willink, and Jocko's as tough a guy as you could ever hope to encounter about literacy, and a number of other people too, who are also seriously tough guys. Um, Congressman Dan, what's Dan's last name? Dan Crenshaw. Oh, Crenshaw, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. I have a bit of memory issues with that sort of thing at the moment. Yeah, well, he's as tough as a bloody boot, that guy, you know, and, 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 and both those characters, and Rex Murphy, who's one of Canada's outstanding journalists, another, he's so damn tough, it's crazy. And they all know perfectly well that literacy is a huge part of what's made them unstoppable. And you don't take that lightly. You know, it's really serious and it's a failing of our education system that it's not, that literacy isn't marketed properly to young men. It's like straighten up, speak properly, write, learn to write. Why? Because that's the same as learning to think. And why should you think? Mm. Well, because you won't do as many stupid things and your horizons will widen. And then too, when you need to entice people along, your journey, hopefully somewhere good, you'll be able to do it because you'll be compelling. And it's, there's something deeply pathological about the way our society markets literacy to young men in particular, because, well, partly we just won't allow for the, let's say the marketing association between toughness and dangerousness and literacy. It, there's mm. something wrong about that, we think, some weird way, and it's just, it's, that's wrong. It's like, yeah. sure, you should be physically tough, and you should be tough in your temperament, as well as having the capacity for play and compassion. You know, that has to be developed too. But that's not enough. And I don't care how tough you are physically, you're nowhere near as tough as you would be if you were physically tough and really literate. And then you're you're an unstoppable force and hopefully for for good and that's a much tougher battle than you know being tough for your own idiotic selfish ends that's just pathetic and so and i just don't understand where we've developed a writing program which is called essay which teaches people how to write while they use it it's a word process but it teaches people how to write as you use it we built that into the program itself and I really want to market it to young men and say, look, you know, get your words together and then see what you can do. And don't be thinking that that's somehow beneath you. That just means you're stupid that you think that. You don't know anything. You think that. It's wrong. And you're limiting yourself so much you can't even imagine it. You might not even figure it out till you're 60 or, and then it's too late. So read, write, think, write. That's, that's what we need. What's good, everybody? We're going to take a quick pause from this week's amazing episode to talk to you guys about our new amazing partners, Short Form. As Dr. Peterson said, knowledge is power, and we need to create a better culture of men who are reading, writing, and becoming more educated. And this is why we partnered with Short Form, because they're here to help you do exactly that. Short form is the best way to learn from all those books you've always wanted to read. I mean, they make the world's best guide for nonfiction book. Basically, they're like book summaries on steroids. Take, for example, one of my favorite books, one I recommended all the time, Dr. Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life. If you go to shortform.com, they'll be able to give you a great summary of the book. And this is a great supplemental tool to use if you need a better understanding of some of the books that you're reading or if you need a recap of books that you've read in your past. 
So go to shortform.com slash roommates to be able to get your five days for free as well as a discount on your subscription. Man, if you have Netflix, you need to have shortform because while Netflix is great for entertainment, shortform is amazing for education and it's not just books. They have so many amazing articles that I quote as well. Go to shortform.com slash roommates, sign up ASAP. I guarantee you won't regret it. And let's get back to this amazing episode. No, that's that's great. Uh, I was also um, I taught middle school, so the the thirteen year old rally people that you that you guys were that was those are my classrooms. I taught seventh grade, and and so one of the things I found was that a lot of the students who couldn't express themselves verbally or written, you know, one of the ways they expressed themselves was through violence. And I think what you what you talked about by the importance of education and importance of being able to articulate your ideas be able to, you know, read is, is, is one of the things that I've seen with a lot of the students that were misbehaving in my classroom because one of the biggest frustrations was not being able to express themselves, especially not being able to, you know, be in an environment where they can succeed academically. So what do you think schools should be doing to be able to help young men do better at this instead of falling behind at the, the race that they've been falling behind at today? Well, I think a fair bit of it is going to have to do with a proper explanation about why they need to learn to write and read. And, and I also think that our schools, led by the faculties of education at universities, which is a corrupt, an enterprise that's become corrupted almost beyond belief, there's no, I, we should make much more of an effort to ensure that kids are unbelievably proficient readers. And a lot of that is going to involve early automatization of letter and phoneme and syllable and word recognition. So, because what happens is when you teach a child to read, first of all, you teach them the alphabet and the sounds. And we have an alphabetic language, thank God, because it makes things much simpler. And so you teach them the letters and then the two letter combinations and then the three letter combinations. And then they can sound out syllables and then they get words. But it isn't until you can read phrases automatically at a glance that you can read for content and pleasure. And so a lot of kids get stuck, especially if they don't come from particularly literate homes where, where all of this is sort of taught, you know, maybe starting at, you know, 12 months when they're first dragging a book around and, and becoming familiar with the book as an object, right, before they even learn to read. You got to get kids through that automatization phase and that requires intense mass practice and that's not that intrinsically interesting right but if you can get them to the point where they can read for content well then it starts to become interesting just as interesting let's say as going to a movie or perhaps playing a video game and so that has to be made an absolute priority and and the fact if the faculties of education were doing their job they would have produced technology to solve that problem for virtually every child because it is only a matter of practice. Smarter kids will learn faster, but with enough practice, pretty much everybody is going to get there. So, and then there's the marketing issue. It's like, well, why should you read? Well, do you want to be stupid? Do you want to be stupid? What happens when you're stupid? You walk into walls because you don't see them. And if someone comes along who's more educated than you, more literate and cannier, they'll just, you'll lose, man. You'll lose. And you'll lose too because you can't think properly. So you won't aim at the right things and you won't be informed by the great individuals of the past. And you need that. We're historical creatures. This isn't optional. So par part of it has to be marketing, for lack of a better word. It's not really that. It's an explanation. Why be literate? Because it makes you, it helps you become who you could be. It helps you move out into the world and have your great adventure. And to bring people along, God only knows what you can do if you've got your words lined up properly. And young men would listen to that if someone who knew what they were talking about was telling them that. As you found out. Yeah. How did you maintain no, discipline in your grade 7 classes? How did I maintain discipline in grade 7 classes? Year 1 or year 2? <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably year 2. Yeah. So, so the way I maintained this year one was chaos. So I taught in, um, uh, 
in a community called it stops. It's in in Dallas, Fort Worth. It's Fort Worth, Texas. It's called the Stop Six Community Historically Black School. Um, probably seventy percent black student bo body population. It's ninety or uh, twelve twenty eight or 29% Hispanic, 1% white. So it was a very difficult school to go to. Year one was absolute chaos, but I'll explain to you how I did it in year two. So what, what I realized was that one of the biggest challenges when it comes to individuals teaching is a authority dynamic. And what yeah. happens with a lot of students is that, you know, they come from environments where they're not used to authority, especially masculine authority. And so they're, they're, they don't respond well to anger and violence, right? But then they do respond well to it if it's their parents who can actually execute the anger and violence. So you just screaming at them, you just punishing them, you just disciplining them does not work. So what I had to do was I, was, I was also the football coach at that team, was I had to do was I had to balance, you know, this dynamic between being able to be a disciplinarian, but also being able to be somebody very compassionate and caring, and people and the students felt like I cared. And so what it ended up happening was after the first year and really building with all the students, when year two came around, there was so much of a rapport from the older students that I taught, because now they went from seventh to eighth grade, that all the younger brothers and sisters in seventh and sixth grade now would be more obedient to me because mm -hmm. of the respect that I've earned from going to war with their older siblings. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. one of the most encouraging parts of my entire school year was, you know, it, it was a very rough school. We, we got a new principal. Just It was absolute chaos. And the principal walked into my classroom the second half of the um, second semester, and he said that we did, a, we did a poll amongst all students, and we asked them, which teacher do you believe cares the most? And, they, and with all, almost all the students said you. And so hmm. to me, by being able to be somebody that they understood genuinely cares and values them, I was then able to be more authoritative and firm because they understood that what I was doing wasn't out of abuse or to take advantage of them or to bully them or diminish them, but was actually to do what was best for them. So gaining their trust um, was the first way to be able to do so. And then also being able to be somebody who's tough and tender, because mm -hmm. if you're too tough, they view you as a totalitarian dictator, and they're going to war against you. If you're, right. you're too tender, they will run you right out that school and, and well, literally if you're, multiple teachers quit. If you're too tough, you're not tough, right? Once you get too tough, yeah. you're that's not tough anymore. That's more like, well, that's more like cruel. And yeah. to be really tough, you have to have, to be truly tough in the proper way, you have to have that drive to interact with the students and to and to be aimed at actually making their lives better. So how did you survive the first year? Um, honestly, what saved me was football. So mm -hmm. I was a football coach and I was, I'm better at like that structure. I'm better at being myself. Cause you know, there, there is an aggressive nature that you can a administer as a football coach that as a teacher, you just can't do some of the things that you could do. And so, mm -hmm. um, what happened was all the alpha males of the school played football. And so by me being their head coach and kind of being, you know, the, the, the top of the dominance hierarchy for them, they fell in line pretty easily. And so mm -hmm. around the... So, so you could when, establish your credibility out there on the football field. And so that, that exactly. gave you a big in. Have you watched Ted Lasso? Um... I have not. I don't think I've watched that. Oh man, what, you, what movie was that? No, it's a it's a TV series. Um, oh, I, Jason oh, Sudeikis, okay. and and he's a coach. He's a football coach from the U.S. who goes to the U.K. to to coach a soccer team. And oh, I think I've seen the, the little commercials for it. It's, yeah, it, it's great. You, I think you'd love it. I, one of the reason I'm bringing it up is because it's one of the few sitcoms that I've seen in the last forty years that actually portrays. Well, people positively, because it portrays virtually every character in a non-naive, positive way. It's very funny and, and very witty, but the main character is an extremely positive male figure. And like that's, I, that just doesn't happen. And so it, it's extremely interesting. And it touches on this issue of the development of leadership and character through sports coaching. And it does that very nicely. Yeah. So yeah. it's good to see that show because, you know... 
those sorts of things are bellwethers for culture and it's great show and he's a wise writer I, some of those scenes are so good it's just it's quite stunning so yeah, I'm, anyways I'm definitely back, check that out. It, it's great man it's really great so okay so you established your credibility and how long did you teach middle school so I, I, I did middle school for two years and then I did preschool for two years. Ooh. So I did, I, did four, I did four years in total. And what happened was the, the biggest fundamental challenge was that I realized that what I was doing was not a sustainable model because the energy and effort that I was putting into my initial seventh grade class when year two came around, I wasn't able to put it into my second seventh grade class because I was still having to, you know, be the father, brother, counselor um, individual to the eighth mm -hmm. graders. So I didn't have the time to do it in the seventh grade. And so then when my eighth graders were going to ninth grade, now my seventh graders were going to eighth, I was getting a new group of kids. I just knew that for what I was doing to be able to establish the change and the structure in the school system, I knew that I couldn't create a sustainable model, which then led me to, you know, want to do other things outside of it, including this podcast. Mm -hmm. And so too bad it was in two some years ways, of say, Although you're teaching I, now to a much broader audience. And so that's a good thing. Yeah. So, and what's funny, know. Dr. Peterson is a lot of my um, older students, like, cause it's been eight years and they, they sad story. They all graduated from there during the um, 2020. And so it's really interesting now that they're all like, I met them when they were 12 years old. They're about, they're 20 year old men now. And I've been meeting with them. I've recently moved back because I, I left the city. I was uh, in Dallas. And so now I'm able to sit down with them and, and now hear their stories about life after, um, you know, our, when I was their coach and their teacher, it's quite fascinating. And, and, and there's so many things that you see. There's so many gaps in their development and so many gaps, like you said, when it comes to education. And then you see a lot of them suffer because of it in the long haul. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's a, I saw so much of that, especially when I was on tour to see how widespread that problem really is, especially that problem of encouragement, you know, and yeah. So and what do you think? What do you think? Uh, no, go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you if, if like in regards to the problem of encouragement, what do you because to me, I feel as though so many of the societal message is always the bumbling idiot, Homer Simpson, Peter Griffin. Yeah. And a lot of men don't have encouraging messages well, to be able look, to start them on a journey to success. It's really if you're afraid of male power, let's say crippling them is one solution. Yeah. Now, it's not a good solution. And that's going to happen if you think of the patriarchy as a tyrant. And look, there's reasons to think that, you know. So I was watching this movie, King Arthur by Guy Ritchie. And when, when the new king, young king Arthur takes his sword, he has flashbacks to his evil uncle killing his father. And it just, it's so terrible that he can't hold on to the sword. And I thought, well, what's Ritchie doing there? It's, well, that's the case for all of us, isn't it? Because when we look into the past and we see our evil uncles, it's just a complete bloody catastrophic mess, isn't it? Slavery and genocide and war and oppression and like, and that's on all of us, isn't it? And it's always lurking there in the background. And so is that male power? Well, yes, in some ways. I mean, if you don't give a man a sword, he can't use a sword, right? So not giving him a sword is one way of making sure he's peaceful, but it's not the, it's not the optimal way. And besides, if you cripple men, they become far more dangerous. They become dangerous in an un terrible underground fashion. Of course, the same is exactly true if you cripple women, but we're speaking particularly of boys because I suppose there's an education crisis among boys and young men. Well, you want to encourage that power because it's actually a tremendous force for good if it's brought under control. And so, but that's a hard thing to get right. And it also requires a lot of trust and work on the part of women because they want to, it's like beauty and the beast, right? Because beauty entices that beast who's a real, who's real, but uncivilized and dangerous. She sort of entices him into becoming fully developed. And that's what a woman has to do when she, you know, has that work project that she marries or has a long-term relationship with. 
But it's much better to encourage with, with faith and trust and say, you know, I saw this really with, with my son, a lot with my son, because he is an ornery little cuss. He, he's quite low in agreeableness, my son, and he loved the word no, and he really worried that word to death. And he, mm-hmm. he was quite, he, he, could, he pushed limits, and it was fun to watch because he was such a little guy. Like, I'll give you an example of this. It's, it's quite funny. When he was about eight months old, he wanted to use the spoon. And it's like, good, kid, you know, so you want to use the spoon, and you got to learn, and so on. And so, and then when he had the spoon, there was no damn way you were going to take that spoon from him. He was going to put up quite the bloody fuss if you were going to take that spoon. But he was also really inclined to play. And so, after he'd had the spoon for about two weeks, he would spend way more time playing than eating. And that was okay, not really, because then he would be hungry, and then he would be crabby, and then he wouldn't have a nap, and then he would upset my wife because he was crabby because he didn't have a nap and things were just degenerating and so I thought all right I'm gonna take the spoon from him because he isn't eating enough and I fought with him that's the fight I had with my son I probably fought with him for three hours before he Mm. would let me feed him with that spoon and it was so interesting Mm. to watch him it was like "Mm, I'm not opening my mouth and he's like nine months old, you know, and I had to poke him in the, in the chest, poke, 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 poke. And then he'd get mad and go, ah, and then I could feed him a little bit of food. And it, I wasn't angry, you know, because I knew I could outweigh a nine month old for God's sake, but three hours, you know, and it was really hard on my wife. She had to leave the room, you know, and because it took some conflict. Well, that's his character. He's a tough he was a tough little kid and inclined to push boundaries and to challenge dominance hierarchies. And, you know, there is an element of that that is challenging and difficult, but he became unbelievably diplomatic from worrying that line, you know. And my wife did a lovely job of shaping and molding that and encouraging it because she wasn't, she wasn't afraid of that and she really loved him. And so, she, and my wife... My wife likes men so sort of deeply. She had her elements of distrust that were part of familial baggage, like, and everybody has that. But fundamentally, she liked men, and she likes to be with men. So, so we had that going for us. But okay. we're afraid of masculine... Huh. Women who've had bad experiences with men can't distinguish competence from tyranny. Mm. And, that's re- and so they, you know, they reject the tyranny... Or they'll marry second-rate men because then they can rule the roost, which is a ba- very bad solution. Yeah, but no, it's fu- it's funny because um, what you describe is what is what I've seen a lot of, and one of the things that happens is that, like you said, men can use their strength to you know build up cities, and also they can use their strength to tear them down. And so, what people want to do is okay, let's just remove their strength altogether. And I meet a lot of young men. You probably experience this numerous of times throughout your 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 work, where I meet a lot of young men whose mom wanted to make them the anti man. You know, you're not mm-hmm. going to be like your dad. You're not going to be like this guy. You're not going to be this. And these men end up having no backbone. They end up having no ability to speak their mind, and they become these prototypical nice guys. And so what has been your experience with dealing with these men who have these nice guy tendencies who can't stand up for themselves, who their moms raised them to be this type of anti-man? Yeah, well, some, sometimes that can also be temperamental, right? Because if a man happens to be high in agreeableness, this is also true of women, they're, they're much more conflict averse and, and, and they're nicer in their temperament. So, so, and so if you get an agreeable boy, let's say, who also has a doting mother, then you might have that problem. There's other ways of having that problem, but that's one way. Well, when I saw people like that in therapy, they were often resentful and angry and passive aggressive and, and getting in their own way often to spite, you know, whoever was doting on them, let's say. And so the first thing I would do is listen to why they were there and then start to unpack that anger and then start to work with the individual to figure out how to voice that. You know, for, you have to separate out what's old history and useless and what's just narcissism and infantilism from genuine concerns. But if you listen to people, they will sort that out for themselves. 
that's one of the cool things about being a therapist is if you listen that happens more or less by itself and then as a behavioral psychologist you know maybe someone like that would need a raise and but would be afraid to ask their boss well we just practice that it's like okay well first of all why should your boss give you a raise like there might be good reasons he doesn't want to lose you because you're a good worker well are you a good worker and if you weren't well we'd solve that problem put yourself in a position where you you deserve the raise okay well now you're yeah. too timid for or you're too unskilled because you have to differentiate those two things too because some people who can't stand up for themselves actually don't know how whereas others are afraid and some are both and so you have to figure out so some of it's skill training. Well, how do you actually ask your boss for a raise? Well, you tell the truth. That's the best way. You say, look, you know, here's what I'm doing. Here's why it's really useful for you. Um, it looks like I'm somewhat underpaid in this role. That's demotivating me, possibly. I also have other options. I think I need, you know, 15% more, and I'm interested in moving up. And here's what I'll do for you if you do that. And so, th you know, think about it. And then if your boss doesn't do that and all that's true, well, then you should be assertive enough to find another job. Or maybe you yeah, yeah, yeah. look for another job before you even ask for the raise. Put your CV together, right? Update it so you're not afraid to look for another job. All this is strategic thinking. That was another thing that was really fun about clinical work. Most of my clients, they doubled or tripled their salaries within three or four years. Oh, you know, wow. they worked at it. This, this wasn't nothing. This was major league strategic planning. And that was true for women and men, you know. So, and that, that's very fun to, to watch that happen. Strate oh, that strategize. Think clearly about it, right? And get your act together. You know, and you got to see what's getting in your way. So maybe you're afraid to ask your boss for a raise because if he says no, you'd have to look for a job and you don't have your resume or CV updated. And the reason you don't have it updated is because you're embarrassed about it's the lacks in it and you don't want to face the lacks because then you'd have to see how you didn't get educated properly because you were useless and you'd have to take steps to rectify that and like it's a real mess down there right yeah. the reasons you're not asking so we'd lay that all out and then say well you're you're embarrassed about your resume well update it and let's take a look at it okay well here's some holes and they're not good what could you do to fix those and then you break it down into small steps right implementable steps because that's very practical so that's a good thing to know if you're if you're if you have your sight set on a goal you'll move towards it if you break the steps down small enough so that even someone as useless as you will do it and that also requires a fair bit of humility because what you might find especially if you're avoiding something is that the step you are actually willing to take is so small that you're embarrassed to admit it to yourself so you won't take any steps at all well, that's completely counterproductive and, and the reason that's not proper thinking let's say or productive thinking is that while well, small steps get bigger real fast and you it doesn't matter where you start if you're doubling your utility every you know few weeks who cares where you start it starts to take off real quick so you don't want to be embarrassed you don't want to be so embarrassed by where you are that it stops you from becoming who you could be and, and that's tough. It can be re that's real tough. I'm not making light of that. I see exactly why people o avoid, but it's it's not a it's not a good solution. So, so for assertiveness, that's what you do, you know. And maybe you practice how people maybe they're afraid to you know ask a woman for a phone number, and so you practice that, and and then you use exposure training. It's like well, go out and practice that. Say hi to a pretty woman when you pass her on the street. That's your task for this week. And see <laughs> how you do. See, see how you respond. See if you can do that. See if you avoid. And if you do avoid, see what you're thinking when you avoid. Mm. You know, and see if you made eye contact. And if you were standing up reasonably straight, like, you know, like a reasonable human being. And we'd practice these tiny things because they are not tiny, man. You wouldn't believe how many yeah. people don't have friends because they don't know how to introduce themselves and shake hands. Mm. I bet you there's 5% of the population has no friends at all because they don't know how to do that. Wow. It's really sad. It is. It's extremely sad. And mm -hmm. I see it all the time. And, and, I, and I love what you talked about, the, the, being proactive about, you know, 
going over your fears because I think for a lot of nice guys is the the fear of rejection, the fear of failure is such a crippling thing to where which is why they either you know disappear into the shadows or just be extremely agreeable. So yeah, well I, 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 here here's a here's a cure for that, man. It's like, do you want the horror of failure or the certainty of failure? The horror mm. of potential failure or the certainty of failure? Because if you don't mm. do this, you will fail. Now it'll be put off but it will absolutely happen. And so that fear, I understand why that stops people. It, there's, it's no joke to be rejected. And it's gonna happen while you practice. And it's a real fear, but you're deluding yourself by thinking that there's a no fear option. There's just a delayed fear option, right? Because if you don't get this mm -hmm. right, well, you're gonna fail for sure. And then you're gonna be miserable and vindictive and bitter and anxiety ridden and you're gonna cause trouble for yourself and you're gonna take it out on women and other men and like, that's an ugly path, man. And so I see why yeah. you're afraid, but you should be way more afraid of that. And that's yeah. a nice way to help people get their thinking straight about fear. It's like no zero right. fear path. That's powerful, so. Dr. Peterson. So in, um, so with 12 rules for life and also with beyond order, you, 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 you've, you've amassed so many amazing rules that um, I just think it's just so phenomenal. One of my favorites is rule four and 12 rules for life. You know, don't compare yourself to others mm -hmm. where others are today, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. And so in your opinion, obviously, you know, there's so many rules that are great, but what do you think is probably, if, if, if somebody was to read those books and there's one rule that you're like, this rule, of the 24 I've given you over these past few years, I, you can absolutely not get this one wrong. Which rule would that be? Tell the truth, or at least mm. don't lie. Because you can't tell the truth, right? Because who are you to tell the truth? That's a, that's a mighty tall order, man. But you can stop mm. saying things that you know are lies. And that will change your life if you do that. Mm. And it's crucial. Why would it change because, their life? Well, how can you adapt to reality when you falsify it? And you mm. think, well, I'm just lying to other people. It's no, no, you're not. You can't just lie to other people because what you say becomes you, especially if you practice it, because we build ourselves out of words. And that can be lies in action, too. It's like, don't, don't say things you know to be false. That's a, that's a good start, man. And it allies yourself with the truth. And that, like, how can that be a bad idea? Ma imagine that what is true reflects reality, which is sort of the definition of true. How can mm. failing to align yourself with reality work? How is that possibly going to work? Well, you say, well, I can, you know, if I lie, I get away with something. It's like, no, you don't. You, I, I tell you, I swear this is true. In all of my clinical practice, I have never, ever seen anyone ever get away with anything even once. You mm. think the chickens won't come home to roost. It's like, all that that means is you're too stupid to see what your lies caused or too blind or too self-deceptive. You just don't see it. And so you don't get away with anything, nothing. It's terrifying to, to actually understand that. It's terrifying. What if you can't get away with anything ever, you know? Well, that's the judgmental God, fundamentally. That's a very yeah. old idea, and it's an old idea for a reason. And of course you can't get away with anything, because imagine that you took a, a flexible plastic comb, you know, and you bent it backwards, and you say, well, I got away with that. It's like, well, what's going to happen when you let go? It's going to snap back and hit you in the face, and that's, that's life, man. You warp the structure of reality? You think you are someone who can warp the structure of reality with your words and get away with it? Really? No, man, that should, that should terrify you right to the core of your soul. You're not God. You can't do so that. Dr. Peterson, you said that you've never seen someone get away with lying Anything. what do you mean by that because i i can imagine if somebody listening to this right now who said well i've i haven't told the truth and i, and I got away with plenty of things in my past what do you mean by yeah, that and everything is right in your life everything is just the way you want it to be that's how it is is it <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, sure. And good. If, if, if find someone like that, great. But I've never seen anyone like that. And psychopaths, mm -hmm. you know, they have no conscience. They lie all the time. Well, how do they get away with it? They don't. They have to move because people figure out who they are and then they have to move on. And so you could say, well, that's getting away with it. It's like, well, no, no, no long term relationships, no love, no trust, no, no, no brotherly affection, no friends. You know, and generally no financial success, not in the real sense. So how is that getting away with it? And then you might say, well, I've got away with it so far. It's like, maybe you have, and maybe you're just too dim to see the consequences because you've blinded yourself and God only knows who you could have been if you wouldn't have lied your way to where you are now. No, it's, I, I, I've never seen it. And you know, sometimes I'd go work with someone to untangle what had happened to them over multiple years as things fell apart and we'd find all sorts of lies not always ones they told but sometimes lies their parents told them for example that deep dark terrible things you know messing things up in a unbelievably catastrophic and tragic way you know it was absolutely terrifying but i can't see how it just doesn't make sense it's like how could you possibly defend the idea that you could warp the structure of reality and get away with it? Mm. I mean, who, who, like I said, who do you think you are? Reality is, you don't mess with it. Like, it kills you. And it'll torture you quite a lot before doing that if you're not, very, if you're un, particularly unlucky. So, beware. You know, they say the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. That's that judgmental God. It's like, you violate your conscience, man you will pay that's hell yeah no yeah. that's that's really powerful and I, and I love the medical physical representation that you talk about throughout your books because I think that's something really big in today's world where a lot of a lot of individuals you know there there's a fear of societal consequences and they don't speak the truth and they lie, yeah. but their spirit and their souls are being torn apart on the inside. And though they appear to be getting away with it, at, when they sleep at night, they just know that they're not being their authentic selves and they know they're living a lie. Yeah, well, and they get weaker as, as you, you become what you practice, you know? And if you withdraw and lie, you become, some, you become a lying coward. That's what happens. You don't have to practice that much before that's the case. Mm. So is that what you want? You know, well, no one will get, no one will come after me. It's, yes, they will. Part of it is also realizing, really understanding in some way that there's no escape. You know, there's no safe path. There's noble path. There's an honorable path. There's no safe path. And possibly you wouldn't want that anyways, because, well, who are you exactly? You know, look at you, you know, mm. warrior stock. Every single one of your ancestors has stayed alive for three and a half billion years. It's like, good work, man. That's a lot. And so, what makes you so sure you're built for safety? What mm. makes you so sure that that's what we should strive for? And then if you want adventure, I'll tell you an adventure or what an adventure is. You tell the truth as nearly as you can and you'll have the adventure of your life. That's <laughs> for sure. So, you know, and that isn't, that isn't trying to fit in because you're naive or you know, because you're too afraid to lie, that doesn't make you telling the truth. If you're too afraid to lie, that's, you know, in, in a cowardly sort of way. There's a wise way of being too afraid to lie. Yeah. So, yeah. and I know, I thought too, you know, when I looked into atrocity deeply, and I looked into it for 15 years, meditated on the human capacity for atrocity, it was pretty awful. It was awful. You know, reading those stories of what happened in the Nazi concentration camps and what happened in, well, everywhere. And then trying to think about what you'd have to be like to do that and then thinking it through. It's awful. And that was, it was doing that. I realized all that was tangled up with lies. And so that's part of this issue of male power. You know, how do you keep male power noble and virtuous with the truth? It's mm. lies that turn competence into tyranny. So don't lie unless you want to be an incompetent tyrant. And you think that's easier. It's like, in some ways, I suppose, it's easier because you can slide into that. But existentially, it's, it's hell. Yeah. And hell has this weird quality because it feels like it's eternal. Mm. 
Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. Um, did you see the recent article? I think um, uh, a professor at NYU named Scott Galloway, I believe his name was, and he talked about how that there is a, a mating crisis going on in the Western world. And one of the reasons why he brought it up was that, you know, in the typical college and university, 60% of them is female, 40% of it is male. And a lot of the college age females or college graduates, you know, um, college graduates who are females, they only want partners who are mm -hmm. also college graduates. So, w w it, have you seen that article? And then, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. about a, a mating crisis? Well, what in seems the to be world? what seems to be happening is that if the if male enrollment falls below a certain percentage, and it looks like it's something like forty percent, then the females start not going too. Mm. And I, that's not surprising. I mean, really? Of course. Uh, how many people meet their prospective mates in university or college? Like, well, pretty much everyone who goes that route. So it's not surprising that that would happen with young people. And so, and the fact that male enrollment is declining is, well, it's a shocking indictment of the education system in general. That, and the failure of boys all the way through the education system is the same thing, the increasing failure of boys. So, you know, part of it, I thought that part of it might be that girls will play boys' games, but boys won't play girls' games. So there's a bit of that going on with boys themselves, I think. But more what do you mean of it by is, that, Dr. Peterson? Well, if a girl plays boys' games, she's admired by the girls and the boys. But if a boy's, boy plays girl games, well, he's not necessarily admired by the girls or the boys, right? That's true. Now, that, I don't mean that that doesn't, I don't mean that, Boys shouldn't play with girls or something stupid like that. Yeah. That isn't what I mean. I'm trying to figure out this enrollment issue and what's going on, you know, and obviously girls, for whatever reason, are being encouraged to value their education in a way that boys aren't, you know, and that's partly marketing and messaging as well, because girls are taught fairly consistently now that they should be their best self and, you know, the world needs more female power and so on and so forth. And that's probably true. But the un underlying message there is, well, instead of boy power and man power, not, not along with, but instead of. Yeah. Because, you know, if yeah. women ran the world, there'd be no wars. It's like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. You really think that? It's like, how dim can you possibly be to believe that? You know, it's... So, so something else I've been hearing, Dr. Peterson, a lot of, a lot of young men have been sharing with me, and I, I'm not sure how much you've heard of it or experienced it. They, they've been sharing that, you know, that they feel as though the average woman has no desire for the average male, and that because of things like social media, online dating, things along those lines, as well as just some of the female empowerment where a lot of women have a some this is what they say an elevated sense of self that 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 mm -hmm. now they feel like they're above a lot of these average males which also contributes to a disparity between young adults being able to connect and form meaningful relationships yeah well men women are more picky in their mate choices than men especially sexually that that's the case in every culture it's and it's not surprising because women have more at stake sexually than men do you know, per episode, because men don't get pregnant, obviously. And so that female pickiness is that that's, that's the case that that's definitely true, whether it's worse now or not, I doubt if it is. Um, I would say to young men who are irritated at women is if you're irritated at women, you know, as a class of creature, there's something wrong with you, because they're right, you're wrong. They're right to not pick you. If they're not picking you, it's because they're right. Wow. Now, that might get, I know that's a terrible thing to say, and I know perfectly well, it wasn't like I was particularly successful with girls when I was young, you know? So I know what that rejection is like. I know what that fear is like. I don't know it as well as some men know it because I wasn't rejected outright. Um, so, but, but what, what you have to understand is that, what do you expect from women? If you got pregnant because you had sex, you'd be pretty damn choosy too. <laughs> so, you know, clue in a bit. And then, well, don't they find you attractive? Well, maybe you're not. Like, <laughs> have you paid attention to how you dress? Do you have a plan? Are you as educated as you could be? You know, are you a liar? Are you a rabid pornography user? Because maybe that's undermining your motivation to seek out a woman and grow yourself up. It's like... 
if you're rejected constantly and you're out there really trying, you know, because that's another thing to ask yourself is, well, how many women have you actually asked out? And are you so sure that you're not picking women who will certainly reject you because you're trying to bat out of your league? Because you might mm. be. So, and I, I'm speaking about this as a clinician too, because I had plenty of men in my practice who were, you know, radically unsuccessful with women. I had one man in particular, he, he was so afraid of women, he couldn't even, well, he couldn't use the phone. He was too afraid of everyone to use the phone. And he had been bullied like mad and, and you know, he had his problems. So I know what this is like, but pornography is a big problem. It's a big problem. It's, it's a real curse, that pornography, um, mm. in my opinion, because it's an easy out. And so we don't, know, we don't know what the consequences of that are. We know, we're starting to understand some of them. But mm. if, you were, if you were better, you'd be more successful with women. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to have that in your mind. And they're not, you cannot be angry at women. It's stupid. Women, it's like, that's, it's like women being angry at men. It's, it's a sign of psychological trouble, that. So you feel as though Dr. Peterson is that, you know, for the, for the men who are complaining about the, the standards of women today and it being mm -hmm. elevated, that it's, it's, it's not so much a, a focus of pointing the finger at them not choosing them, but more so looking in the mirror and asking themselves what can they do mm -hmm. to improve themselves to be so desirable instead of focusing yeah. simply in on the inability of, yeah, you yeah. know, what be you're Be a little stronger, today. be a little stronger, dress a little better, speak a little more clearly, aim a little higher, like, and practice that, you know, and, and that'll work. Now, you know, I know that that's more difficult for some people than others because some people bear incredibly difficult developmental burdens, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying that this is easy, but I'm saying that <laughs> it's a useful reaction. Like, what else are you gonna do? What else are you gonna do, complain about women? You know, I've seen that in men. I went out with a group of men who were having trouble with their wives and they'd gone off to this like couples retreat and it was mostly rubbish, although they were trying a bit to get their lives together. And I spent a whole day with them. There were three of them. And one of them was a guy that I'd known for quite a while. And every single word he said was a lie. <laughs> and so, and all these three did the whole day was complain about their wives. And I thought, what the hell's wrong with you guys? Like you picked them. They're, they're these women you picked, you know, and maybe they have their flaws, but they're your wives, and that's how you talk about them? And you think they're the problem? You're so dumb that you don't even know that you shouldn't badmouth your wife. Just because she's your wife. Like, when, when Tammy and I got married, we had a discussion about that. It's like, she has her flaws, and I have my flaws, but I'm her husband, and she's my wife, and there's a certain respect that goes along with that category, if you have any sense. And so that's an extension of the same thing. You know, it's best to look to yourself. Now that now and then you can, you know, things have gone rotten in society and you have to, to bear your responsibility. You have to address that at a social level and a communal level, but fundamentally it's like, and you do so, so much less harm if you look to yourself first as the problem. But then believe me, you're plenty of problem for you. That's, you're all the problem you need for you. That's for sure. Yeah. So what, what would you say, Dr. Peterson, to the, to the young men who are pushing back on this idea and the young men who, who say, like, you know, traditionally speaking, there was a sort of mating where if you were a guy, you're a middle class, you can get a middle class partner. You were a guy making $40,000 a year, you can get a certain level of partner. That in, in some communities, in some environments, you know, because of, you know, degrees or things like that, if you're a guy, you know, making $50,000 a year or $60,000 a year and you're doing relatively well, that the women in your in your cohort who are who are similar partners to you may not desire you instead of wanting a partner making 60 want a partner making 80 so what yeah, would you say mostly, to those guys mostly say, I'd, mostly i'd say that was an excuse and but i wouldn't okay. go farther than that because you know i don't know how to answer those questions in some ways at a collective level 
which is why I focus on the individual. If someone came to me and told me that, the first thing I would do is listen to them for like 10 sessions just mm. to find out what they're thinking and to find out what the problem actually is because they think they know what the problem is you know it's these picky women mm. and that could be the problem you know for them it might be maybe there's a demographic issue or community issue that I don't understand so I wouldn't assume that I knew what the problem was but those sorts of things in my experience have to be solved at a high level of detail like at high resolution so let's say you are having trouble finding a mate you know, and you think, well, I'm, you know, I'm reasonably symmetrical, I'm in decent physical condition, I'm young, I have a, a decent salary, but still, okay, well, that's a deep dive issue. I don't know what, what's wrong. We'd have to talk about that. And I do mostly listen. It's like, you seem okay, so why, why don't you have a partner? Well, that's a deep mystery. Like, it's really a deep mystery. It's nothing trivial. There's no simple solution to that. And so, yeah. again, that's why... I don't really do sociology in some sense, you know, uh, except insofar as I understand the role of the individual in relationship to society, you know, mm. so I would go, I would say, I would say to someone like that, go, you know, practically, if you want to do something, go see a behavioral, cognitive behavioral psychologist and take the problem apart yeah. and strategize that you'll figure well, out how to fix good. it. That's good. That's good because I think it's a serious problem, what? right? Yeah, definitely a serious problem. And I think what ends up happening is that, like you said, too many people create a one size fit all problem to their mm. to what they're going on. So they say, well, the reason I'm unsuccessful is because of A, but in reality, if you could talk to a wiser mm. individual and sit down, you might realize that the problem isn't a, aka the women, maybe the problem is that, you know, you're lacking confidence, you're lacking communication skills, you're picking the wrong kind of individuals, and there's a, a, a myriad of varieties of issues instead of just simply making it exactly. just a one-size-fit-all problem. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's also in some ways a lot less depressing to, to particularize like that, because mm. you find out a bunch of problems you don't have, right? So you can just, mm. those, are, those aren't my problems turns out my problem is this and then that might yeah. be non-trivial and probably is but it, at least it's not everything right yeah. and I also think that when we talk about things like climate change it's like well really there's no such thing as the climate it's not a useful word when you're trying to solve a problem and what do you mean by change exactly like the, these are really low resolution concepts and all the solutions are high resolution and it requi requires particularized expertise to solve some genuine actionable problem. You have to decompose the problem. And then you have to be satisfied with addressing some micro element of it. There's no fixing climate change. It, that, that conceptually, that's just, it's just an indication of uh, an unsophisticated thinking. That's all it is. And then there's an insistence. Well, climate change is real. Well, what do you mean by real? What do you mean by change? What do you mean by climate? How much do you know about climate? And I'm just picking on that because it's a real overgeneralization. It's not helpful. Yeah. And when you talk to real That's experts, powerful. they've particularized. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Glenn Schellenberger, I, I hope I've got that right. I just talked to him. He wrote this book recently called Apocalypse Never. And he was a climate activist, an eco-activist for a long time. But, but you know, he, he kept delving into things and particularizing them. And then he wrote this book. And one of the things he said was, he talked to an MIT scientist who said, if you want to knock carbon dioxide emissions down, the best thing to do would be to work to help India burn more coal. It's like, who would guess that except a particularized expert. And the reason for that is that it's better than wood. And it's a pathway on the way to natural gas and perhaps nuclear. But it's not obvious. Yeah. Because in the short term, it makes the problem worse, or it seems to. And so that's particularized knowledge. And you have to particularize your problem. Why can't men find women to date? That's not your problem. Your problem is mm. why you can't find the woman you want. Yeah. And you, you have to assume that's your problem, because otherwise you have to assume that it's the women's problem. And yeah. really? They're all wrong and you're right. Really? Hmm. Yeah. Lucky you. Maybe you are. You're an undiscovered gem of some sort. Probably not. <laughs>
Oh no, that was that was that was really powerful, Jordan Peterson. I, I love the the call always back to accountability. And so, as as one who's been married for so many decades, I think one of the challenges a lot of men do is they they they, they aim at, for the wrong women or they pick the wrong women. So, in your personal experience from your years of marriage and there's also years of study, what would you say are are, are things that men to need to be focusing in? on when it's trying to select a woman for a long-term marriage partner? Well, you want someone honest. That's really, really important. Someone who will, who will do her best to tell, you, tell the truth. And my wife swore she'd do that before we got married, and, and she has. Probably better than I have. And so that's, that's a rock, man, at the bottom of things, you know? Mm. So that's... And, you can't underplay the role of sexual attraction and that's a mysterious thing and so that's that's crucial as far as i'm concerned and and can't be so just, I have a real you know question about yeah. that jordan peterson dr peterson so you mentioned pornography and we do countless mm -hmm. pieces of content to be able to help young men overcome that issue and provide a tons of resources to help them support them. So what I've noticed that happens sometimes is because of years of watching pornography, the men's sexual attraction becomes warped. And so what, how can a man whose sexual attraction to women has become warped to the extreme ends due to uh, um, so much cons consumption of pornography, how can that man go back to now being attracted to, you know, more natural looking women or more women that could be around their, you know, their, their lives instead of the, the, the projected. Well, deprivation you know, is helpful. Yeah. You know, I mean, so I think it's reasonable to assume that there's an, a novelty edge in pornography, like there is in so many quasi addictive phen phenomena. And so it has to become because it because novelty is a sexual kick it has to stay novel and that means that over time it's going to become more extreme so that's not good well so how do you resensitize yourself in some sense well you stop you stop and then hopefully you recover and then you deprive yourself of that outlet let's say and you might say well you know is is that absolutely necessary and maybe there's nothing wrong with pornography it's like well I don't know, man. Like, have you ever really met a guy who is proud of that? Like, you know what I mean? That makes him feel like I'm the guy, man. Uh, you know, I'm watching pornography and getting off. It's like, what a man. I don't believe anyone feels that. And to me, maybe I'm wrong. Um, and to me, that's an indication that, yeah, we know. No, it's pretty cheap. It's cheap. It's easy. And, you know, I say that knowing that I believe the research evidence shows that if you introduce pornography into a community, that rate, rates of sexual crime committed by men upon women actually decline. So there is perhaps some utility in the outlet, but you know that's a unidimensional analysis and doesn't take into account all the other effects of pornography. Yeah. So including the ones you described, and I think that those are real. It makes sense that they're real. You know, because it's super satiation, and and it's a, and it's it's a non-trivial technological problem. You know, it's now possible for a young men to look at more beautiful nude women in one day than any man has ever seen. You know, prior to ten years ago, twenty years ago, than any man in history had ever seen. That's not yeah. nothing. That's something. And to think that doesn't do anything to you, it's like, no, that that's that likely does something to you. So. Yeah. Don't substitute the, the false for the real. Mm. And, and don't underestimate the utility of deprivation. You know, you do, what, what do we need to drive us forward to have the adventure of our life? You know, well, some, dep some deprivation, that's for sure. That, that uh, heightens desire and drive. And maybe you need that. You're afraid to approach a woman. Well, you remove part of your drive with pornography, and so now you don't have that sexual urge to overcome that anxiety, and so you stay timid for your entire life. You know, maybe not, but, but maybe. Yeah. So, um, honesty, 
the attraction? Is there anything else that you feel as though is extremely important that, you know, that this is things that you may need to be focusing on for, for picking a long-term partner? I'd have to particularize it probably after that. Uh, knowing her family, I think, is useful. Mm -hmm. And my wife has a, a very a very solid family, and that's been that's been a good thing. So I'm fortunate in that. So and you think too, you know, you, you're gonna have kids. Is this a person that you think would be a good mother and an enjoyable partner? Have someone you can have some fun with. And and spar with a bit too, you know. So, that's powerful, Dr. Peterson. Uh, thank you so much. Um, all the wisdom that you you've been sharing has been been so powerful. I mean, I just been sitting here, listening, learning, gleaning from you, just gaining so much information. And I hope that so many men can be able to get this, and, and women as well. And so, what would be a closing message you want to leave? the men and women who are watching this episode, who are trying to build lives of purpose, who are trying to build lives of meaning, who want to leave a legacy on this earth. What would yeah, be your well, closing message to those individuals? Don't underestimate the hole your absence would leave. Mm. You know, each of yeah. us, we're remarkable creatures and we have something to offer to the world, to our people we love, to the world at large. It's our responsibility to make that manifest, and we move a little farther away from paradise every time that doesn't happen. Mm. Really, really. Mm. Mm. So, wow. you know, this is serious business, and we're very technologically powerful now. We can't afford too much psychological immaturity. That's powerful. Dr. Peterson, thank you. Thank you so much for, for those words. Guys, please, man, you already know how we get down at the roommates. Be sure to reach out to Dr. Peterson. Let him know what about the podcast stood out to you guys. Man, this episode is so much powerful, man. You probably got to, I know I got to watch this multiple times because there's probably so many things that I missed the first time around. And there are so many amazing resources here at the roommates to help men and women become the best version of yourself. So please take advantage of it as well as take advantage of Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life and also Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life because there's so much wisdom that if Jordan was to share all of it, we would spend years and months and he was able to compact that all together into um, two amazing pieces of work. So if you have not gotten those two books, be sure to get those books. Dr. Peterson, words Thank cannot you, describe how grateful I am for this conversation. I'm, Where I'm can very, people find you at? I go to my YouTube site. That's probably the best thing to do. So just okay. type in Jordan B, B. Peterson or Jordan Peterson in YouTube and you'll find it pretty quick. So thanks a lot. If they want to send you a message about the podcast, about how much it impacted your life, work is there e uh, do you prefer email, Twitter, um, your website? What's I read YouTube comments. Com okay, cool. Sounds yeah. good. So that's the best Sounds way because I do read them. So awesome. really good talking to you. I really appreciate the invitation I and the conversation and like best of luck with what you're doing and your continued endeavors. It's like good work, man, and keep it up. Thank you. So guys, you already know how to get, we get down. Send Dr. Peterson a message. Let him know what about the podcast it out to you. My name is Hafiz and I'm joined by Dr. Jordan Peterson. Nice we got our roommates and... Have a great day.